Hello, I'm Diana Chavez with Sun Reconstruction Solutions. Today we have a wonderful webinar on getting paid faster with liens, bonds, and contracts conducted by construction lien expert for California, Bill Porter. So let's get started. Well, thank you. I'm going to uh, talk for about 20 minutes or so, uh, hopefully. And, and uh, since it's such a short time, let's just, just jump right into things. So um, we'll start with contracts. If you can see from uh, your screen, um, let me move on to, the, ah, there's, I'll, I'll hit this, a, le a legal disclaimer. And this is about, you know, every situation is different and we can't cover everything in, in the seminar. Uh, if anybody has a question on the first slide is my phone number and my email. And if you have a question, give me a call. Okay, um, this is about me. It says I've been doing this for over 30 years. I'm a construction attorney and various things that I've done. All right, let's talk about contracts. Very important right off the bat is when you get your contract, um, you can't just sign these kinds of things. You need to review them carefully. You need to understand what each clause in the, the contract means. If you don't understand the clause, then you wanna seek legal counsel to help you with that. Also, there are classes on the subject of understanding, interpreting, and negotiating your contract. I teach one of those myself. If you're in California, uh, you can take those, um, uh, uh, I teach them up here. I'm in Sacramento, but um, I teach classes all over the place. And if you have any questions, again, give me a call. Now you wanna offer edits. If you see something that's unfair, offer an edit to it. Edits should be initialed by both sides in the negotiation. Do not sign the contract in, until all the edits are initialed by both sides. Uh, and now we're, we're talking about getting paid quickly. So you want to focus when you're reviewing the contract on clauses that talk about when you get paid. You, you mostly have to deal with the issue of do not allow the other side of the contract in, to ne negotiation to have a clause that says you will get paid when I get paid. That stretches it out possibly for years because those clauses generally include provisions for um, the, the other side. Let's say you're a subcontractor. The GC and the owner are going to have to fight it out. It could go years in court before you get paid. So somewhere along the line in your negotiations and changes of the contract, you want to change it to a reasonable amount of time. Uh, I would say that if you could, if you could say that uh, no longer than either the period of time within which you must file a mechanics lien stop notice or payment bond claim, that seems very reasonable. In fact, it's, 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 it's extremely reasonable, reasonable on behalf of a claimant because it will come up very quickly, but it sounds reasonable in terms of, of an edit. Um, there's a couple cases that you, you might be, um, may or may not be knowledgeable about, but I wanna discuss them. One is Clark versus Safeco. It's a, a fairly old California Supreme Court case. It says this, that let's say you're a sub, the contracts cannot say, uh, you don't get paid if I don't get paid, because that means if they don't get paid, you never get paid. That's not right. You did your work. You need to get paid. So this is why they extend the times for payment to a reasonable amount of time, but that could go on for years and years. So anytime you encounter those, you want to fight it on the basis of Clark versus Safeco. Sometimes I just write in the margin. I write illegal in California, Clark versus Safeco. C, I'll spell it, C-L-A-R-K-E versus Safeco, S-A-F-E-C-O. You can find all kinds of articles about it if you Google it. It's a California Supreme Court case. The other case is called Crosno versus Travelers. That's C-R-O-S-N-O versus Travelers. This is the kind of uh, case that tries to shorten for you the deadline of when you get paid. Uh, you can't have an indefinite pay deadline. What they were criticizing is the kind of a case that says, you get paid when I get paid, even if it's years and years and years down the line. In this particular case, it, it seems that uh, as far as the public work, works payment bond case goes in civil code 8122, the most that you should wait to be paid is six months plus 90 days after the project is completed. So um, uh, that is a much shorter period of time than waiting for a case to go through court and then the court of appeals. Right now, um, in many counties, they're setting trials out in trial setting conferences for two years from the time of that trial setting conference. So you want to use these things to get paid quicker. So in the negotiation stage, focus on 
making the period of time within you which you get paid when there's a dispute to be much and much less than would otherwise be the case. Okay, uh, there are some other things that you wanna put in your contract. Attorney fee clauses, this is very important. The, the reason for this is that you want to be able to give the argument when you are in the right, when you're correct, when there's no reason for them not to be paying you, that, okay, you wanna get an attorney fee clause in there so you can say, hey, listen, you haven't paid me, that's okay, because I'm in the right, you owe me the money, and when we go to court, I'm going to win, and you're gonna pay not only your own attorney, of course, but you're gonna pay my attorney too, because I'm in the right, and you owe me the money. So that's very important. That is the attorney fee clause. It's, it's really, really important to a quick resolution. If you see a contract where um, it doesn't have an attorney fee clause uh, coming down from, let's say, a GC to you as a sub, then you need to put it in because when, when the case goes forward with all the other subs, you might be the only one who has an attorney fee clause because you push for it. And then that would be key to you settling out your case, getting paid early, and the other people will have to go months and months or years and years down the line. Also, I would say if you want to get paid quicker, avoid the mediation clause. Arbitration is fine; it'll get it'll it'll proceed much quicker. But sometimes mediation is used as a delaying tactic or a what we would call a discovery device, so that the other side can find out about your your case. Also, in your contract negotiation, make sure that you have an interest clause. So if they're late paying you, you get interest. You can probably go one and a half percent a month. If you go higher than that, the court is probably going to knock it down and say that it's usury, which is like you being a loan shark. Okay. Um, on the indemnification clause, always a very important clause. If you can avoid the word uh, defend, that would probably be pretty good because that means you paying for the other side's attorney. Also, look for the, the, the word solely or sole because you don't want to be liable except in the event that it's solely the other party's fault, okay? Because to tell you the truth, it's never solely or very, very rarely solely someone else's fault. And so you don't wanna get caught up in that having to defend and indemnify and all of that, except when it's solely the other person's fault. In comparison, comparative fault is okay, uh, which is fault based on how much you're responsible for the thing that occurred that is the problem as compared to everyone else. So let's say you're only 10% at fault, then, then that's all that's, that's gonna be a part of your liability will be 10%. So I would push for comparative fault. I would, I would get out of defending and I would avoid the word solely in the contract that you are forced to sign. Okay, um, also if you have claims, you wanna follow the procedures, the claims procedures in your contract to the letter. Don't get it wrong because that will delay you getting paid. Okay, and then I mentioned, I think before, you only want to sign a contract after all the edits that have been made are initialed by both parties, and preferably the other party signs it and you sign last. But it's very important that both sides initial every change, okay, if you have handwritten them in or in some other way, but both sides have to initial all the changes. Every time a change is made in negotiation, it's a counter proposal. So counter proposals can go back and forth and back and forth and back. All right, and then of course, uh, during the project, and sometimes it's a pain to have to do it, but you always want to communicate in writing as much as you can. You want to document every issue and you want to docu document them favorably towards your position of the facts, but you need to be accurate. When, if you go into um, uh, the field of inaccuracy, then once, you, once you're not accurate, then it blows your credibility. So be accurate, but be fierce towards your position and sound credible and save everything, save all your writing so that later on, if you have a dispute, as they say sometimes, um, uh, the party with the more, most uh, paperwork generally wins. And there's some truth to that. So document everything as much as you can. Okay, now that's it on contracts. And in short time, we're halfway through this. Um, let's talk about mechanics liens, stop payment notices and, and payment bond claims. These are great leverage. Uh, very important in this is that uh, you do the preliminary notice, because in many cases, if you do not do the preliminary notice, then you're not going to have a right to a mechanics lien, a stop uh, a payment notice, or a payment bond claim. Okay, um, 
uh, the preliminary notice is a prerequisite for all subs and suppliers on, on a private works project. And I'm going over my um, points here. It's a prerequisite for general contractors on private works projects where there's a construction loan in place. Otherwise, GCs don't have to do a preliminary notice. But if they want to go after that construction loan, then GCs do. Okay, but in public works, the GC never has to send a preliminary notice but it's a prerequisite for everyone other than a first tier sub, okay? And if, you do, if you're supposed to do a preliminary notice under the standards on this PowerPoint page and you don't, then you're likely not gonna have a right to either a mechanics lien, a stop payment notice, or a payment bond claim. And if you don't have that right, you don't have the leverage. Okay, uh, let's talk about uh, the releases. Sometimes as a project progresses, you're gonna have to do conditional and unconditional releases on progress payment and on final payment. They're 8132 to 8138 of the civil code and do them properly. Otherwise you will perpetually delay your payment. So you gotta go along with that game. And, and if you don't, everyone else is gonna get paid but you, so do it right. Okay, let's talk about the mechanics lien briefly. The mechanics lien is great because it allows you, let's say as a sub or supplier to jump over the general contractor and go directly against the owner's property and if you're not paid, you can have the owner's property sold so you get paid. So you can imagine that puts great pressure on the owner and the owner puts great pressure on the, on the general contractor to get things resolved. This is a huge leverage, all right? Um, there are rules when these things have to be done. And for, I, I noted here, it says 30, 60 or 90 days. So uh, when you record your mechanics lien, if you're a subcontractor or supplier, is 30 days after there's a valid notice of completion. Okay, and if you're the general contractor, it's gonna be 60 days after a valid notice of completion. And if there's no valid notice of completion, then it's gonna be 90 days after the project is completed in its entirety by everyone, except for warranty and, and, and um, repairs. Okay, but if the main contract work is completed, then you, and there's no notice of completion, you have 90 days to record your lien, then, you have 90 more days to file a lawsuit. <coughs> Excuse me. If you miss the 90 day deadline or the 30, 60 or 90 day deadline, then you're gonna lose your right to the mechanics lien. Okay, let's talk about stop payment notices. The stop payment notice stops money from flowing either from the lender uh, or the owner to the general contractor. And that's great leverage against the general contractor to get you paid. Um, you're going to send it within 30 days of a notice of completion, or if there's no notice of completion, 90 days after the project is completed. So you always want to hit these deadlines. Um, if you're unsure of the deadlines and you want to you want to be sure to get it right, send <coughs> excuse me whoever it is from your office who's in charge of these things, send them to a class on mechanics lien stop payment notices and payment bond claims. In fact, I have a, a class. Um, it's uh, appliedlegal.com, that's appliedlegal.com, and it teaches all this stuff if you want to go there. But otherwise, you can probably go to your local builders exchange, and they're all over the state, and take a class there. And I, I teach these classes all the time. Really enjoy it. Um, okay, uh, let's talk about, let me move on from this, payment bond claims. That's the third. You got mechanics lien, stop payment notices, and payment bond claims. The payment bond claim is, is a real leverage against the general contractor because the payment bond company will pay you for your claim if you're if you have a legitimate claim and then they're just going to come against the general contractor to indemnify themselves uh, so really it's it's going against the general contractor but you have this pool of money of rational people who will not play games with you uh, who may delay a bit but ultimately they'll pay you pay you and that puts a lot of pressure on the gc all these things the mechanics lien, the stop payment notice, and, and the payment bond claim, they put pressure. They are the kinds of things you need to use to your benefit to get yourself paid as quickly as you can. Um, here are some of uh, your arguments to um, uh, resolve things quickly. Okay, you wanna be right. So if you're wrong, then you have to you have to say, honestly, okay, I'm wrong on this, and then see get the best deal you can because you're wrong. But if you're right, then you can argue things like, like I discussed. Hey, pay me or you're going to end up paying your attorney fees and my attorney fees, and you're going to pay interest. 
right? And let's say it's a one and a half percent a month as I pay. I mean, these are your arguments here. Okay, yeah, pay. You're going to pay my attorney fees, your own. You're going to pay interest at one and a half percent a month. And then also prompt payment interest. And this is really interesting. It's at the bottom of this slide I'm showing here. Prompt payment interest is under various uh, code section. There's there's civil code, there's a public contract code, there's the business and professions code. And you can probably find an article if you Google um, California construction prompt payment remedies. And you'll probably see a list or a table. I use a table when I teach courses on this, which shows them all. And what they generally state is that if you are the GC, let's say, uh, and the owner doesn't pay you, then you can get 2% a month, okay? That's nice, that's 24% a year. Uh, and then if you are a, uh, let's say, a subcontractor, and the GC has not, uh, ha let's say the GC has been paid for your work and has not paid the uh, payment on to you, has not passed it on to you, then you can get that 2% a month. But also, under some of the statutes, not only can you get the 2% a month, but you can get your own interest in the contract because some of these statutes say 2% in lieu of interest, meaning uh, ex you know, excluding the interest in your contract, we're gonna give you 2% a month. But some of the other statutes on point for prompt payment remedies say 2% a month in addition to interest. So if you get the 2% a month and then you have your contractual interest of 1.5% a month, then I, I believe uh, the math works out to 42% annual interest. Geez, that's really good. I wish I could get that all the time in investments. Of course, uh, you can get rich quickly getting 42% every year. Anyway, these are the arguments. So not only do you say, yeah, okay, fine, I'm right, you owe me the money. And in fact, you got paid and then you didn't pass payment on to me, which is a, a violation of contractor's license law as well. Uh, okay, then, uh, You'll pay my fees. You'll pay me, in some cases, up to 42% a month interest. And you say to them, look, pay me now. Although Otherwise, it's going to be worse much later. So it is, it is all the process of you using the, the document process with a, a good contract, paying attention to your deadlines on mechanics liens, stop payment notices, and payment bond claims, keeping in mind prompt payment interest that is available, having your attorney fee clause and, and your um, uh, interest in your contract that are the tools that you can use to protect yourself and really above everyone else who doesn't do these things, be the squeaky wheel that gets the grease and, and get your case settled, get your situation settled so you get the money in your pocket instead of going you know, five years down the line on, on a big project and uh, paying out a huge amount in attorney fees and then ultimately settling the case, perhaps for the same amount that you could have settled it if you had paid attention to these things early on. So um, anyway, let me see here. Um, oh, that is the end of the seminar. I see I'm 30 seconds early on my clock and uh, I, I don't know if we have any questions out there. No, Bill, at the moment I don't see any questions. Um, okay. Nobody really wrote anything, but um, they're welcome to email us or call us, correct? Okay, yes, and, and me too. Uh, my uh, phone number and my email address is there if you have any questions, if I didn't explain something thoroughly. Well, I don't think I could have really explained too much very thoroughly because uh, I packed about two hours of things in 20 minutes. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but uh, there's a lot of information on our website and um, on Sunrays as well. If, uh, if you go to our website, porterlaw.com, uh, you can find all kinds of articles and forms and things, which all apply to California law and uh, the field of construction. Anyway, though, it was really a pleasure presenting to you on a Friday, uh, and I hope you all have a nice weekend, and, and uh, thank you very much for listening in today. Thank you. Then I will say bye-bye.